Hi, I'm here to talk about and share the practical approaches to using opioids, especially to do this within the National Opioid Use Guidelines. So today in this talk, I hope that we can get across the use of the Opioid Use Guidelines, be familiar with their five modules, and to uh, use the tools that they've advised uh, a little bit more effectively in your practice. And then finally, what to do with the actual trials and tapering and monitor and the actual practical use of the opioids themselves. The Canadian National Opioid Use Guidelines was launched around May 2010. It was a collaborative between many of the colleges across Canada and a huge key knowledge leader group. It's basically split up into about five modules and over 24 recommendations and it helps guide you how to start a trial, how to screen for the best patients and then also in those that we need to taper how to deal with those things. So there's a lot more tools in that that you can find in those guidelines guidelines. What were they trying to do with these? We were really trying to find and improve safety in using these medications because they're tough to use. So the Canadian guideline for safe and effective use of opioids for chronic non-cancer pain, effectively the National Opioid Use Guidelines, is pretty comprehensive but they've been updating the website at the National Pain Center in McMaster. Here you can see a made reference in this slide that you can pick up different parts of it and learn the modules and actually integrate tools into your practice through your smartphone and through the EMRs. So I encourage you to make use of that. So as we know, the effects of chronic pain is pretty severe. It's pr pretty much the whole person. It has effects on physical functioning. It really changes the way the mood and psychological functioning works. And then of course, what it does to the person's relationships, family, work, and school, let alone the costs it has on both the patient, their families, and society in general. Part of Module 1 in the National Opioid Use Guidelines is looking at all the factors that help us decide when we should even think about trialing opioids in a patient. So if pain is moderate to severe, if it has a huge impact on the function and quality of life, maybe maximized non-opioid type medications and strategies were already tried. Opioids uh, may be very indicated for specific conditions like bony metastases and that nothing else will be helpful for that. And then of course we're looking at building in safety to make sure it's actually appropriate for the patient even though the pain syndrome is uh, going to be uh, treated well with opioids. Is the patient in the patient context safe to use? So that means compliance, patient consent, form that there's actually responsibility for the use and prescribing on both sides with the physician and with the patient themselves. In this slide, the opioid use guideline uh, refers to one of the ways to screen for the risks with our patients and this includes the opioid risk tool. So this is pretty easy. You can see in this tool there's a difference between the scoring systems for females and males and this is uh, applied to adult patients only. Um, they really look at some major factors factors such as family history of substance abuse, personal history of um, substance abuse, age especially within the working age, and the history of sexual abuse um, in adolescent time in addition to any psychological comorbid conditions such as obsessive compulsive disease, bipolar, or schizophrenia and depression. These different scores just give you a guideline as to what risks and vulnerabilities that patient might have if they do start opioids. So it doesn't mean that someone can't use opioids, it just means that it heightens your awareness and maybe some supports and the boundaries with which you're prescribing this. So all of us have heard about the universal precautions in pain medicine and these were well published in fact by Canadian authors uh, some years ago. And it really is actually applicable for all medications, not just opioids. So obviously we have to have a diagnosis that's appropriate, um, the psychological assessment that helps us screen for any vulnerabilities of people who may use any medication inappropriately. Ideally, we want an informed consent, either both verbal or by written, that could be given out in the office. And in doing that, what we're looking to do is uh, to make sure that expectations between patients and clinicians and even our pharmacists are, are, are aligned, that we're all on the same page. And the treatment agreement is very similar to the informed consent. It's akin to understanding that if something is not helping that patient meet 
meet their goals, then we've got to start shifting and reviewing the use of that medication. And in particular with opioids, if there is no major change in function, it really doesn't make sense to continue the opioids. And finally, what we're trying to achieve. So beforehand, there are some measures such as pain or function, sleep, function at work. We want to set out some objective goals so that we can measure if these uh, medications are going to be effective. So you see in this slide is an example of the treatment agreement. In the National Opioid Use uh, Guidelines that you can see on the McMaster website, this is one example that you can just pull down and use in your EMR. You're welcome to alter and add to it, but a summary of the content is to keep this um, medication uh, use safe. And so some of the principles here is around single prescribers, um, letting the uh, health pr care provider know uh, um, when patients are going on vacation, taking time away, how frequent the follow-ups are going to be, setting expectations during the time when a new medication is being tried of what a patient should be doing to keep it safe and also what the clinician is going to be doing to keep this safe. And then finally, to set expectations that if things aren't changing and improving function, then these medications have to come off. So this also sets expectation on review periods. In this slide, we finish off the other five of the principles on the universal precautions in the, in the use of any medications for pain management. Um, during this appropriate trial uh, period for any new medication, but in particular opioids, somewhere between four weeks to four months uh, allows you that time to add on any non-opioid medications, any other strategies to minimize the use and dosage of the opioid and it actually helps one to replace any short-acting medications with longer-acting medications and see how that becomes a stable dose. Um, so that trial of opioid therapy is, is quite active and the follow-up is often a lot more frequent once a week to every two to four weeks, but some regularity so that medications can be switched up, dosages can be switched up, and uh, decisions on whether or not a drug is going to be tapered will be done. The other principles and precautions in the use of uh, medications in general is always during this trial period is a review. And in particular with opioids, it's the six A's. So this is the analgesia, activities, any adverse uh, side effects. Um, what they say, ambiguous drug taking behavior or really a medication misuse, um, at the affect and emotional state, and then finally is our own accurate uh, documentation. And that's kind of highlighted in point number 10, where we really need to document our conversations, our dosages, um, how they're uh, using it, uh, and what also are the functional goals that we're trying to match the medications to. So in the National Opioid Use Guidelines, the uh, Cluster 2 is the second phase of information where they're um, just summarizing how is it that we monitor and start this trial. So the principles always hold true. You want to start low dose, you want to go slow and titrating up, and uh, looking at some optimal dose. And optimal dose doesn't mean perfect, it doesn't mean that the pain's completely gone, but that the goals of the, the functional um, outcomes that, that that the patient and, and you have um, agreed on is, is met or is actually getting towards and that we're achieving some stability in the symptoms. And sometimes when it's during crisis pain, it's just simply stability of mood uh, that may be the major outcome, uh, at least for the time being, uh, to achieve. So during this time, of course, documenting the progress is key, and that's why those goals setting up front even before the trial gets started is so key. I made reference in previous slides on how to establish some goals up front so that we know where to go with this therapy. And just to reemphasize, this slide is making use of the other arms of pain management, which isn't just dealing with the numeric rating score or use of a medication 
We need to see a patient move and function better. We need to build their confidence in going back to certain activities that won't increase harm. So physical therapies, psychological therapies, um, uh, complementary therapies have a big role as well. And obviously um, the other types of medications have their parallel use. But finally, just wanted to emphasize that in pain management in particular, self-management strategies to help overcome fears and to um, actually use even their medications better are so key. And there's a number of resources that other presentations are going to be addressing. So here I wanted to just summarize the typical analgesic toolbox as they refer to it. So there's the general non-opioid group and then the opioids that are available in BC. So here in BC, uh, we are familiar with the Butrans patch or the buprenorphine patch. Uh, there's also the fentanyl patch, but those are not usually used in patients who have not been exposed to opioids at all. The others are codeine, hydromorphone, morphine, oxycodone, and tramadol, I would even put in here as a mu agonist. So in this slide, I just wanted to summarize, there's a number of factors that impact the way we choose which opioids to start with. If someone hasn't been exposed to opioids at all, obviously maximizing non-opioid management strategy is the way to go. But if we're getting to the time where we're making a decision to start an opioid, then many of them are appropriate. Most of the time as clinicians, we start off with a short trial of the short acting ones to see if there's even any effect and also if there's any major side effects that will limit the way you can increase your doses. The other factors, of course, includes cost, coverage, how compliant a patient is of um, short duration and frequency of dosing versus single day dosing. And then of course, what their past experience was in the past with any medications in general. And then lastly, there are some, uh, some practical points like are they able to take uh, the medications orally or we have to start considering patch forms, um, what's their digestive system and their liver system and clearance uh, of these medications. So some of these will play in to our decision. These next two slides are pretty busy. They just summarize some guiding principles as to the starting dosages on the various opioids available to us in BC. So codeine, tramadol, morphine are uh, located on this page. And without going to all the details here, really at the very far right of the slide is some suggested optimal maximum dosages. Like it is with the National Opioid Use Guidelines document, they do feel that the oral equivalent of morphine of 200 milligrams per day is what they call a watchful dose. So you can see here that these are uh, under or at about the equivalent of that dose to be the guided maximum. For non-cancer pain, it is accepted in the community that beyond that doesn't quite make sense, the diagnosis may be wrong, or that there are other factors involved in these higher doses, and we really need to review with vigilance, uh, uh, especially at that time. The second slide is also highlighting the medications, particularly oxycodone hydromorphone. You'll notice on these slides, I have not put on buprenorphine or fentanyl patches, but I will address the equivalent doses in the next slide. This slide generally summarizes the accepted equivalences uh, that has been uh, understood in the, uh, the clinician community. They are not hard and fast rules, but they are just general guidelines. And it really changes depending on how much and how long a patient's been exposed to opioids. Also, elderly age versus young ages is very different. The renal and liver function totally changes these equivalences. Methadone in particular is a very variable medication uh, to try to transition to because that really depends on how long you've been taking this medication. So when should we decide to stop the opioid therapy? The three guiding principles include the following. It's not having any pain relief. It's actually causing major side effects that doesn't allow you to um, switch up the dose or even rotate to another one 
Or third is that they have no change in their function, even using reasonable doses of the medication. And if those goals aren't changing, or in fact, if you detect misuse of the medication, or um, they're not following in compliance of the way you're dosing it, there needs to be tighter um, uh, conditions around its use to keep it safe, or that we may have to discontinue it altogether. So how do we practically taper opioids? It really begins with an honest conversation with the patient where the opioids aren't making a difference on their function or in fact making other aspects of their life worse and that may be mood, sleep, um, and bowel function, cognitive function. Lastly, if a patient is having problems using it properly or using it safely, again, the honest discussion to say that this is not the appropriate therapy needs to be had. During that discussion though, it, it, just an open discussion around how to do this safely includes doing it slowly, helping them know what that dosing schedule is gonna look like and how frequent you're gonna be following them up. Lastly, just to reassure them that they're not going to go through withdrawal symptoms if we go down a very controlled and measured time of tapering. So it's just really important to reassure them. At the same time, they need to be aware of what those possible withdrawal symptoms may be. That includes increased pain, so it kind of sets expectations and they're not feeling panicky around loss of a, a medication. It would uh, maybe affect their bowel function to have increased stool movement or even loose stools. There can be restlessness, disturbed sleep. All of those things would be normal and therefore if they feel that, they should report that to you and we can slow that taper down. Sometimes we might choose to add a medication like clonidine or Lyrica just to make that period of tapering a lot easier for the patient. So the key learning points from today's discussion is the following. The National Opioid Use Guidelines were launched in May 2010 to help support all of us to make opioid prescribing safer, easier, and more effective for patients in general. The consideration for uh, using long-term opioid therapy has a lot of different factors, but once we are determining that this is a, a helpful part of the multimodal approach to pain, then there are these guidelines that exist to help us screen for those who are a bit more vulnerable in using these opioids and having side effects, and then guiding us into how to uh, do a trial and taper where necessary. Then lastly, I really just want to emphasize that the chronic non-cancer pain syndromes um, do respond to opioids where appropriate, but really it's only one aspect of a multimodal approach uh, to managing pain and importantly, the pain-related disability. So this slide entitled Opioid Tapering Protocol is pretty specific on how to taper the, uh, the opioids. Usually the guiding principle is about 10% reduction every one week up to every four weeks for a very slow taper. And by doing that, you actually uh, really reduce the uh, amount of withdrawal type symptoms that a patient can experience. Where appropriate, the dose should be held if they're feeling that symptoms are really exacerbated and then prolong that tapering period. These next few slides are helping us to distinguish between some overlapping principles on dependence, tolerance, and addiction. So I just wanted to use these slides to define what those are and to give us some clarity as to how different patients respond. So physical dependence is a phenomenon where uh, any medications used uh, can produce a change in symptoms and uh, physical symptoms once the medication is withdrawn. These kinds of symptoms can occur when a drug is abruptly discontinued or a dose is substantially reduced or if an antagonist like naloxone or naltrexone is administered and these symptoms can start after even just two weeks of regular use. In particular with opioids, there are late and early signs that can be distinguished depending on how quickly the drug is withdrawn. Sometimes these symptoms include agitation, anxiety, insomnia, increased pain or muscle aches, tears, runny nose, sweating, yawning. More late type symptoms include vomiting, abdominal cramping, diarrhea.
This slide highlights the two definitions on tolerance and pseudo-addiction. Tolerance is the phenomenon of where you're observing that the initial effect that someone had on a certain dose isn't holding or that you're having to increase those doses to maintain and achieve a certain effect. This is different from pseudo-addiction where here uh, the behaviors of wanting medications uh, seems like it could be like addictive behaviors. Uh, these are suggested by um, clock watching, uh, wanting uh, more medications, maybe drug seeking. Um, and in fact, this is really underpinned by the fact that the pain isn't well treated. In this slide, we're trying to differentiate addiction from pseudo-addiction. So addiction is truly a neurobiologic disease where there has to be genetic, sociological, environmental, and the psychological factors all leading to the trigger of the addictive behavior. So the four C's in particular highlight what addiction is, and this is craving. These are compulsive use, um, the loss of control over the use of medications. And lastly, it's continued to use the medications despite the fact that there's harmful or major side effects uh, from the medications. These underpin addiction. So what's the addiction risk for um, patients who are on chronic opioid use? So the studies by Ferlin and group had highlighted somewhere between 4 to 26 percent of patients may have an opioid use disorder. So in other words, some tendency to want to crave for or um, uh, misuse the opioids. Uh, and this is a really variable um, representation because it's not studies done in all types of patients and really more detailed studies need to be done. But bearing those kinds of percentages in mind, it just raises our vigilance to make sure that patients are using these safely. So one in 10 patients may be intentionally overusing them. They may be using alcohol concurrently or even other illicit drugs while, while they're using opioids. And so this is the reason why the opioid use guidelines uh, does emphasize other safety parameters like urine drug screening, communications with your pharmacist, even concurrent um, uh, discussions with family. Thanks for your attention. I hope that was useful, but as you can imagine, I won't be taking any questions.